talk to you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? So this one, are you labbed up? Can you hear me now? In the back, can you hear me? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Looks good, huh? Yeah, I'm good. Well, it's good to be back in the beach. Hmm. You know, I used to live here about seven years ago. I lived here in 06 and 07. I had a house in Coconut Grove. It was a wonderful time. The winter, you know, here is the season. Um, is it possible to go ahead and put my diagram up? Beautiful. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with the Open Transactions Project, but I've been working on it since about January 2010. And you know, the, the theme that I think I have today is trust no one. Um, I had a dream last night. I had a dream that I was at the Clevelander Hotel on the roof. <laughs> it was a great party. There were a lot of familiar faces there. Tony was there, Margo was there, Vitalik was there, Satoshi was there. And what he said was, what is needed is to replace trusted entities with systems of cryptographic proof. So any entity that you see in the Bitcoin community that you have to trust is going to go away. It's going to cease to exist. Silk Road was a neat concept. But even if they hadn't been shut down, they would have ceased to exist because they acted as a trusted entity. Mount Gox someday will cease to exist because it acts as a trusted entity. You have to trust them to hold your Bitcoins. You have to trust them with your account ledger that says how many that you supposedly have. You have to trust them to give those coins back to you. This is not Satoshi's dream. Satoshi's dream was not that you have to trust a bunch of new trusted entities. His dream was to eliminate these entities entirely. Either eliminate the risk entirely or distribute that risk in such a way that it's practically eliminated. Even Bitcoin doesn't completely eliminate risk. It just distributes it in a way that gives us a practical elimination of risk. There are still attacks. Now, open transactions, what I built was a transaction server. Now, let's think about this for a second. Bitcoin, what Satoshi did was, he said, we have these trusted servers, I don't want any trusted entities, so I'm going to eliminate them. We're going to eliminate all servers. It went purely P2P, and the blockchain is a solution to trust in a P2P way. And there's trade-offs there. The benefit is, the number one benefit, is that it's censorship resistant. The drawbacks are, it's, it's expensive, it's slow, um, but it's censorship resistant. You guys all remember Napster? Remember being at the party, double click, play some songs on Napster, everyone's dancing? And then uh, some lawyers came and shut it down. They said, this is, this is against copyright regulations, so we're gonna shut it down. They had a photo op, they shook hands, unplugged the server. The next day, BitTorrent. Today, something like 35 to 40 percent of all internet upload traffic is BitTorrent. Why didn't they shut it down? They shut Napster down. Why didn't they shut BitTorrent down? Because they can't. That's right. We know they would if they could, but they can't, so they won't. You all remember eGold, Douglas Jackson? Douglas Jackson was a fine fellow. 
He was an oncologist, and he went into the business of eGold, which is a website where you can make accounts and you can have gold and transfer gold to each other. It was really cool. It was growing like crazy. Billions of dollars went through there. And then one day they came, knocked on his door, slapped an ankle bracelet on him, tagged his ear like a whale, and shut him down. Did they have congressional hearings about eGold? No. They put him in an ankle bracelet and kicked him into the dustbin of history. But last year, they had congressional hearings about Bitcoin. Why? With eGold, they just shut it down. Why didn't they shut down Bitcoin? Because they can't. Because it's censorship resistant. That's the whole nature of the design. When it first came out, people say, oh, well, it's this untraceable currency. Well, no, we know that. We know it's not un untraceable at all. It's got a complete record of the full ledger. But what it is, is censorship resistant. And Satoshi accomplished this because he wanted to eliminate all trusted authorities, and you have to do that in a censorship resistant way, or it's just going to be shut down. With open transactions, what I thought was, I'm not going to eliminate servers, like Bitcoin just eliminated servers entirely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the need to trust servers. I'm going to make servers that you don't have to trust. So you don't have to trust them to hold your Bitcoin. You don't have to trust them to keep your ledger with your account balance record. You don't have to trust them to give your money back to you and so on and so forth. I originally designed it for use with, you know, things like gold. But as soon as I became aware of Bitcoin, I realized that, you know, these are technologies and you can use technologies together and you get a system that gains the benefits of both. Uh, an analogy that I like to use is the wing and the wheel. Now, the wheel is very useful for moving along the ground. It's basically useless for moving through the air. The wing is very useful for moving through the air, and it's useless for traveling along the ground. So these two technologies will never be in competition with each other, and they'll most likely end up being integrated into a single system that gains the benefits of both, like an airplane. Airplane can sort of move along the ground and move through the air because it just uses both. And I realized very quickly on that I could use Bitcoin with OT to make OT censorship resistant. Now, why would you want to use servers? Why wouldn't you just keep everything on the blockchain and just not use servers at all? That's a fair question, especially in this community. This is the eliminate servers community. But then I asked myself, well, why is this community building all these servers then? Why are they building Mt. Gox? They use a server. Why use it at all? If the blockchain does what we need, why are we building a server and then asking them to be trusted to hold our Bitcoins? It seems like it goes against the whole philosophy of the thing. With open transactions, you see some servers here numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. It's a transaction server. It processes transactions. Let's say I want to form a transaction, because I, this is a very confusing thing. People say, it's going to process my transactions, but he can't, he can't change my balance. Why is it that the server can't change my balance? PayPal can change my balance, right? PayPal goes in and changes your balance to whatever number they want, and then you got to get all mad and call them on the phone and beg and hire lawyers or whatever. That's your, that's your recourse. Why not have a server that just can't do that? So the way it works in OT is, uses triple entry accounting. Everyone knows what a digital signature is, right? They're unforgeable. So in OT, your account is your last receipt. That's it. So let's say that I want to transfer uh, some clams to George or Bob. I make a receipt on the client side. My client software creates a receipt. It says, you know, my current balance is 100 clams. And I'm going to send 10 clams to Bob, and my new balance will be 90 clams, signed, and there's a signature there that the server can't forge. 
and they send this request to the server, the server verifies it, countersigns it, sends it back to me. The server is like a notary. There are many servers, because the only thing a server can really do to hurt you is refuse to process your transactions, in which case we have a federated model, you would use a different server. Sort of like Tor. Tor uses servers. One of the out proxies isn't out proxying for you, you use a different one. It's that simple. So because the server can't forge my signature on the receipt, the server can't change my balance because my balance is just whatever appears on the last signed receipt. It's unforgeable. The server can't falsify any transactions, it can't forge any transactions. Now I kind of want to go into some of the details here about voting pools. Does everyone here know what a voting pool is? A few? Does everyone here know what multi-sig is? Yeah, that's what I figured. All right, multi-sig. It's possible in Bitcoin to send a transaction to multiple addresses at once. So let's say that instead of sending a transaction to one address, I send it to a list of 10 addresses. And then you have to get a vote to get the coins back out. Say a vote, eight out of 10. Eight out of 10 transactions, or excuse me, eight out of 10 servers can vote to release coins back out. The reason is because you don't wanna have to trust the server to hold your money. Right, we have unforgeable receipts. Yeah, Mt. Gox could do that, right? They could use OT and have unforgeable receipts, but they're still holding your coins. That's why we want to switch to a voting pool. With a voting pool, you would have, say, 10 or 20 servers across multiple jurisdictions. And when you upload your coins to a server, they're actually not going to that server, they're going into the pool. The server can still verify that they went into the pool. It can still give you units in your account, and you can still use them in the system but the server can't steal them. You don't have to trust the server not to steal your coins. Now what is the benefit? Once these coins go into the pool and now you have units on the server, why would we be using a server in the first place instead of just sticking to the blockchain, right? Well, of course, I already brought up the question, well, if that's the case, why are we using Mt. Gox and Bitstamp and these sorts of things in the first place? Why are we using coin mixers in the first place? There are a lot of servers out there that we're building because they do things that we need them to do and we need them to do those things so bad that we're even willing to trust them with our coins. We should be able to do these things without trusting them with our coins. So what are the kinds of things you can do on OT? Well, you can do transactions extremely fast, much faster than any blockchain. You can do transactions extremely cheaply, much more cheaply than any blockchain could ever possibly process transactions. You can do microtransactions. You can do a variety of financial instruments. OT includes checks, cashier's checks, untraceable cash, includes basket currencies. You can issue stocks, you can pay dividends, you can trade on markets. You can trade on markets at different scale. By the way, for later on, I recommend you Google our new videos showing off the desktop GUI. Uh, just Google for open transactions, new desktop videos. You can watch them later. And I kind of walk you through and show you the application, show you everything that it does. So what you see here with these multiple servers is voting pools, where users have uploaded coins into voting pools where the coins can't be stolen by the server that you're using. And of course, also the server can't forge your receipt. Now keep in mind that the last signed receipt proves everything. It proves your current balance. It proves which instruments are valid. It proves which transactions have cleared. You can throw away all the other receipts. Of course, I'm not recommending that you destroy all your receipts. I'm just saying that if you did, it could still prove everything. All OT needs is the last signed receipt. And both sides have a copy. So the servers are more like a notary than anything else. They verify what people signed already and they countersign it. But, be, but through that mechanism, 
we're able to process all these transactions without storing any history. And we're able to do it in such a way that you don't have to trust the server. Not to hold your coins and not to control your ledger balance. And so any system I believe out there today that requires you to trust them with their ledger balance or with your coins is going to change. They're either going to cease to exist or they're going to have to upgrade their technology because their competitors will be using this sort of stuff. Now, I can't really see it here. I think this is kind of washed out. Is it possible to darken this or there's some things missing off the picture here? But I'm just going to I'm just going to show you. Right here, we have a name coin layer. It's on the diagram, but somehow it's not showing up on the screen. It says name coin right there. And right here, we have a bit message layer down at the bottom. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Now, what does Namecoin do? We all know what a certificate authority is, right? Certificate authority is some guy that you have to trust to verify your identity. Oh, thank you. Does it work? Oh, yeah, there we go. I'll be outside pointing this at airplanes. Yeah. There's Namecoin, right? Now, what you could actually put here, you could put a certificate authority. OT works with a certificate authority. We're using OpenSSL, and OpenSSL can use a certificate authority if that's what you want to do. I'm sure we'll have enterprise customers on the commercial side that'll want to use certificate authorities because that's what kind of people they are. And a certificate authority is a guy you have to trust to verify your identity. He's also the guy that you serve a subpoena to if you want to falsify someone's identity. If you want to perform a man in the middle attack, you just walk your happy ass down to the certificate authority office, serve them with a warrant, and now you can impersonate whoever you want. And you can use that to put malware on people's computers, spy on people, steal their money. So, I, certificate authorities work for a lot of things. They're great for the enterprise, but I don't like them. I want to be able to eliminate that trusted entity. And so our first integration, and we have this integrated, it's not merged back in the main branch yet, but it's in a side branch that's working, is Namecoin. Namecoin is a blockchain-based solution that uses the Bitcoin code that allows you to issue identity, create identity, without having to use a certificate authority, without having to trust anyone. But don't lose your key. Key management will be a new problem. But that's fine because you don't have to use Namecoin. The truth is you can use any identity system here at this layer because we built open transactions um, to be agnostic to this sort of thing. It always uses an abstraction layer to do these things. So we have an abstraction layer and then we have Namecoin as like a plug into that abstraction layer. But if you look at the BitShares forum, they're, they're talking about how they're going to integrate OT. They have an identity system called Quixote. If any of you are familiar with that, that would go right there. You could also use Bitcoin itself to register identities. That's what I was originally, originally going to do, but we ended up going with Namecoin because it's you know, kind of what it's for. And this enables the servers and the users to prove who they are to each other without necessarily having to use a certificate authority. Just eliminate the trusted entity entirely. And what we see here is these voting pools for different currencies. Right? So we've got Bitcoin. And then you also see some colored coins here. Gold colored coin, dollar colored coin, euro colored coin. Now, this isn't the ultimate destination, but one of the stops along the way is going to be colored coins. Because colored coins allow you to issue currencies um, on the blockchain. To use little Satoshis on the blockchain to trade around dollars or euros and so on. 
And we believe that currency issuers are going to issue these currencies, and that's basically all they're going to do. They're not going to run exchanges. They're not going to keep your ledger balance, anything like that. They will be AML KYC compliant. They'll take bank wires in and out. They'll be compliant. And then they'll release colored coins in return. Those colored coins can then be uploaded into OT voting pools, just like normal Bitcoins can be. So normal Bitcoins and colored coins representing all other currencies will go into these voting pools where they are then traded on these servers in market exchanges and so on. These servers have the technological capability to operate with full anonymity on Tor. They never have to take any money in or out besides coins, colored coins, bitcoins. We're going to see, I believe, every coin integrated here. Ethereum is going to integrate with OT. BitShares is going to integrate with OT. All the coins are going to integrate with OT. Am I short on time? You're getting there. Getting there. <laughs> For about five minutes. We can take questions or you can finish up. No, I don't need any questions. No, they, they understand. You can ask questions outside, for God's sake. Just so everybody knows, um, this is as tight as it's going to get. Next, after lunch, we're opening up the second hall, and uh, we're going to be doing this similar stuff that way. So it's not going to be quite as packed for all you nice folks in the wall. All right. Just like doing that. Now, there's a couple articles I'd like, to, I'd like you guys to check out if you get the chance. They're on a blog called Bitcoinism. So you can just look it up later, Bitcoinism. And there's one article called Voting Pools, and it talks about the voting pools and how they're all going to work. And there's another article called Lex Cryptographia, which is a really exciting one. I recommend it. if you watch the OT videos, then go and read that article, Lex Cryptographia. See, the idea with voting pools is, is even though the issuers are fully compliant, most people don't ever have to deal with them. The reason is because you can just buy and sell colored coins from other users. The users can just buy and sell these coins from each other. They can use local bitcoins or whatever. They never actually have to go to the issuer. There will be people who do here and there, but it's not going to be something that everybody has to do just to use the system. It will be something that a few market maker entities do and that's it. But I still have a problem with that. The problem that I have is you still have to trust someone in that case to hold your money. And I just don't like that. I don't like trusting people to hold my money. That's so 20th century. We wouldn't even have it now except it's been protected through regulations. And so it's managed to eke out an existence longer than it would technologically be able to justify in a free market. So the long-term solution is Lex Cryptographia. And this is where we have virtual corporations, because OT is able to make virtual corporations. We're going to have virtual corporations where agents take funds in and out in various asset types, and they post Bitcoin bonds to cover the fact that they're willing to move in and out for people. And then we're going to go through our bit message layer for discovery for these agents. And we're going to use bit message. That was at the bottom, right? Can you see that? Bit message down at the bottom. The point of BitMessage is it enables these entities to communicate and discover each other without having to have a server to meet on. So for example, wiring funds from one server to another, cross-server exchange, a bazaar. You know what a bazaar is? It's like a marketplace. Things like eBay, for example. You won't really need an eBay site anymore because you'll have channels, P2P channels where orders can be posted, offers and, offers and listings can be posted. And people will be able to go and look at browse orders of different types on different channels and purchase directly from other users without having to have some clearinghouse site where all the ads are posted. That's why I said things like Silk Road, they're just going to go away. You're not going to need any kind of site like this anymore. And also we believe that their app stores are going to move to this direction. Same thing, you don't need some central entity to control the app store. Instead, there'll just be channels, and people will have lists of which vendors they trust, and they'll search listings without having some central server. All right, now, I'm out of time, but I'm going to take one question, because I got this one guy going nuts. 
What's your question? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here, you're going to get the microphone. Thank you. You know, it sounds uh, really awesome and a great compliment, like you said, the wheel and the wing. Um, and I'm just wondering, when are we going to see this? happen? Like, what's, when do you think this will become a reality? Because I think everybody sounds, I'm sure everyone's really excited. All right, well, okay. Everyone got that question. When, when is this going to happen? Uh, the answer is, first of all, Open Transactions is an open source project. All the source code is posted publicly now on GitHub. There is a library, there's a low-level API, there's a high-level API, there's a server. Um, there's a desktop client, which you can see in the videos. You can download it and build it yourself. The API is available in many languages, available in C, C++, Python, Java, D, Go. And so we have a community built around it, people popping up, using it, integrating into things. It's being integrated into OpenSim and many other things. Uh, there's an IRC channel, freenode.net, pound open transactions. There's a bunch of people on there right now working on it. And so on the open source side, it's going very well. And we have a, like I said, a, a desktop client that it's just gotten to the point where we started to make the first Mac installs. You can build it yourself, but if you want the easy one-click install, we just have a, te a test install now for Mac that we're testing. And pretty soon, we're going to release uh, installs for that, as well as Linux and Windows, because it was written in Qt or Qt, which builds across all three platforms. Okay, also, on the commercial side, my company, Monitas, we're building commercial software based on the OT libraries. Uh, we're about to close our second round of funding, and we're doing very well. We're up to about 10 people right now and growing fast. We're based in Switzerland, which is a great country for starting businesses in. Um, and we have an iPhone client, which you'll see in the videos. And we also have an Android client in development right now. And also, of course, sort of more scalable architecture on the server side. But we, we believe that most of our users will just be open source users. We want to make it an open source standard. We want most people to just download it and use it for whatever they want to do. And then, you know, Monitas sort of aims to be like the, uh, the red hat of open transactions, in a sense, or the Mozilla. I don't know if you guys know this. Did you know that Google pays Mozilla $300 million a year? just to be the default search engine. A anyone can download Mozilla and build it. How many here have downloaded Mozilla and compiled it with their comp C compiler? Right, two. All the rest of you downloaded it from Mozilla and that's why Google paid them $300 million last year. So we believe there's plenty of ways to monetize open source software. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. <laughs> and by the way, I just want to say, is this on? I just want to say thank you, Satoshi Nakamoto. Thank God for Satoshi Nakamoto. Somebody give Satoshi a seat. For God's sakes, why don't you get up and give Satoshi a seat? He's